Hello, this is the Macro Church of Christ Sunday 7 26 2020 worship service recording for those of you who are listening to it. We're glad you're here. Remember to remember to have your Bibles, your sermon copy, your unleavened bread, your grape juice, and some songs. And remember if you're going to contribute to contribute to the address we have there for you. Remember that you're going to be singing and you sing because we're God's people. And don't forget to include the little ones in your in your worship and hang around and we'll get ready to get started in just a minute. We're glad you're here and glad God has blessed you to be here with us. Yeah. All right. Well, welcome. Song, song books, Mike. Uh, I'm sorry. Can you ask me for Does anybody books? need song books? If anybody wants a song book to sing, remember the song numbers on the back of the the song books, the song numbers on the back of the sermon outline. Uh, and so it tells you the number. And if you you should have your own song book in your car because we never collected those back from you because we want you to hold on to those so we don't have to keep cleaning them. Uh, just keep it in your car if you have one, and then when you come back, just bring it with you. But Troy has some if you need one. So let me go ahead and start this, and we'll start. Everybody ready? Here we go. Oh! With us while Brother Don leads us in the prayer. Holy Father, we come to you and give thanks of who you are, because you are everything to us. Without you, we are nothing, and we would have nothing and be nothing. So you have blessed us abundantly. We are all here on this first day of the week to out onto you and worship you in spirit and in truth according to thy holy will help us do that help us be built up when mike feeds us thy word to be edified and strengthened that we may handle every device of the evil one help us to help one another and to love one another every day of the week also help us be fully equipped this day to take what mike teaches us it's your world, your word, your will, and may it strengthen us, and may it build us up. May it give us courage to speak thy truth and to spread it to everybody that's in need. For it is a broad way out there, but we want everyone to come onto the narrow way, because the narrow way is broad enough to be able to have all have eternal life that will do thy will and obey thy word. So, Father, we pray down and bow down to you also, and ask you to forgive us 
Forgive us for the times we've passed up opportunities to teach others and to love others. And forgive us for the things we say we ought not and things we should not do that we do. So this day we pray, Father, that you would lift us up, encourage us that we may encourage others. And we thank you for your love, for you are love. Be with us as we sing, be with us as we pray, be with us all the days of our life. And then we look forward to that hope, that great hope to, in Christ to die with thee and to be with thee forever. And where we will never die, heaven is a place we all wanna go and help us to focus our sights on that and set our mind every day on things of above not on things of the earth and help us to know that you are with us and we can walk with you and we can help others and spread love and joy and peace and thy word. So give us the strength and courage to do this father and be with us this day as we worship and serve you In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. The next song, if you're using your song books is going to be 183. 183 is the next song and here we go. make sure that you peel off the very top of your communion cup and so that you'll be able to take part of the bread in just a minute after we give prayer for it. Remember, it's the real small little tab on the top. You have two. You have a real small one that has a little filament and then the one underneath it. You want the first one so you can get to the wafer on top. There's a little piece of bread up there as we do the Lord's Supper. I want to welcome everyone this morning. This is the part of our service that Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. We remember what he went through as he suffered, as they beat him, spit on him. Nail the, put the nails in his hands and his feet. And we think, when we think of him in that instant, we think that he's the victim. But he wound up being 
the victor. And we can be the victor, we can be victors through Jesus Christ. Notice that he never said that partaking of the Lord's Supper will save you. So we don't do this to be saved. We do this simply because we are saved and we remember Jesus who is the reason why we are saved. Would you please bow with me? Father God, we thank you so much for being who you say you are. Our creator, the giver of all good and perfect gifts. And our Father who is compassionate, who is merciful. We thank you for your son. We thank you for sending him to this earth that we might have an example of how to live on this earth and that we might understand the sacrifices that Jesus made and that sacrifice that we can make help others understand what he has done for them. We thank you for these two simple emblems, the unleavened bread, which Jesus says is his body. And we understand that it, it's unleavened because in the Bible, leaven represents sin. And Jesus had no sin. We just pray that it would bless our spirits this morning as we remember Jesus Christ today and throughout this coming week. We love you. We give you all the honor, the praise, the glory, and the thanksgiving for all things. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. As we continue our memorial of the Lord and his death, remember that it is his death that we're remembering. Because without his death, you and I wouldn't be able to make it to heaven. But because of his death, and us believing in his atoning sacrifice, and God offering it, we can make it to heaven. So as we drink this cup, remember that it represents the life of Jesus, represents his blood that saves us from our sins. And so as you drink it, remember that. Let's have a prayer. Lord God and Father in heaven, we thank you so much. Not only that you created us, but that when we fell, that you had a plan to make us right with you. We thank you for the fact that you showed us your character and your love by sending the word down to become flesh so that he might die for us, so that through him, Father, we might have the hope of eternal life. We pray that as we drink this cup, Father, that we would remember the blood of your son Jesus and the life that he gave, so that we might go out into the world and give our life for others in serving them and in bringing them to you and in serving you. We ask, Father, that you look down upon us and as this blood makes it possible that you forgive us all for our sins as we drink this cup in the name of your son. Amen.
remember that as one of God's people, one of the things that we get to do is we get to share. Not just simply the way the world shares, but we get to share because of our relationship with God and our relationship with one another. And because we're going to share because we want to serve God and please him. And we want to have his character. And God has shared eternal life with us. And so we share what we have with others. Remember that as you give today or as you give your time or your energy or your effort. Remember that we're doing that because of what Jesus did for us. We're not, do, we're not doing it to get something back, but we're doing it as a demonstration of our faith in Jesus and our love for him and for man. So if you would, would you bow with me, please? Lord God and Father in heaven, we just thank you for every blessing you give to us. We thank you for the ability that we have to work, even though some of us are having a difficult time today because of the pandemic. We pray that you would bless those people that are working on that and find, trying to find a cure. That you be with our, our, our rulers so that they might make decisions that allow us to continue to provide for our families. But we thank you for all that you give to us, our life, our breath, and the job that we have, and all the way you take care of us. We thank you for everything, but we especially thank you for the benefits that we have of being your people. And so therefore, we want to share with others, like you shared with us, the grace that you've poured upon us. So help us as we do that in our giving and help us as we do that in our time and in our energy and in our efforts. We pray that we always love you and love people and do that by sharing what we have. And so we thank you and praise you for all you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Next song we're going to be singing is 229. 229 if you have a songbook. Hey! Text is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 14. So if you take a look at that, we'll be covering the first 19 verses, although we're going to be reading verse 1. Just simply for this, from the standpoint of being able to save a little bit of time, it says, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1. Pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. And so remember that we've been talking about the use of spiritual gifts. And we're going to talk about the proper use of spiritual gifts today. We're going, to, we're going to notice, as we always have, that the preaching of the cross is a spiritual message revealed by the Spirit of God, and not the wisdom of men, and that God gifts his people to help in the work of Jesus. Remember, that's why God gifts us. He gifts us so we can help the work of God. And if you remember, 
uh, he's going to tell us how, how that is that we use those gifts. Now, if you were here for last week's lesson, you might then ask the question, if gifts have ceased, why do we need to know this? And the answer is because at the time that Paul wrote, the gifts were still there. The church was young. The New Testament hadn't been written. The church wasn't fully matured yet. And so therefore, they had gifts. But what this chapter does for us is it teaches us about the use of any gifts that God gives to us, whether they're, they're you know, special miraculous gifts or, or whether they are just what you and I would call normal everyday gifts. And yet we all are gifted by the Holy Spirit somehow in some way. And as we go through this and notice how the spiritual gifts were, were to be used, we're also going to learn how every gift is to be used. We're going to learn the difference between being gifted, no matter what kind of gift you have, and actually loving people, which is what we're supposed to do. Let me remind you of a couple of things real quick. The purpose for spiritual gifts was that people might come to know Jesus. The purpose for spiritual gifts was not to heal everybody. It wasn't to be able to speak every language. It wasn't to be able to know every mysteries of the universe. It was given for us for the purpose of being able to know who Jesus is and the proof of that message. That was the purpose. And, and what endures in all of this is love. Love is what's important in the activity that we do and the way in which we do them. Uh, love is what matters. He pointed out in 1 Corinthians 13 that you can be gifted with all the wonderful gifts, but if you don't have love, it's worthless. And then he told us that the gifts are going to cease that we talked about last week, but, that, but what's going to continue and what continues today is love, hope, and faith. And so as we get into this section, remember that this is an example of love in the church edification. In other words, he's going to tell us how it is that we're supposed to edify one another. And therefore, he answers the question, what are the gifts used for and how are they supposed to be used? 1 Corinthians 14, verses 1 through 5 says, Pursue love, it desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. For no one understands, but in, the, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. But one who prophesies speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consolation. One who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but one who prophesies edifies the church. Now I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you would prophesy. And greater is one who prophesies than the one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets, so that the church may receive edifying. And so as we look at these verses, one of the very first things that Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, is that charity is what matters. Now, in order to demonstrate this, in order to prove this, he's going to give you the example of the difference between speaking in tongues and the difference between prophecy. And he's not necessarily telling us that speaking in tongues in their days was bad. It's bad if you don't use it properly, if you don't use it in love. And that's the point that he's trying to make here. And that's why he's using tongue speaking and he's using prophecy because tongue speaking meant that you could speak a multitude of languages. The only problem is, is that most people don't know a multitude of languages. So you might be able to speak German really well, but if your audience doesn't know German, it doesn't help them. Uh, you might be able to speak in, in uh, I don't know, uh, monkey language. And maybe the monkeys can understand you, but nobody else is going to be able to understand you. And so the idea of speaking in tongues is the idea of speaking in multiple languages, but it only does somebody any good if somebody tells them what it is that he's actually saying. And by the way, that's what he's going to be talking about. He's going to be using this example to prove to us and to teach us how it is that we're supposed to use our spiritual gifts, whether supernatural or whether normal. And so charity is what really matters. Remember, charity is just another word for love. Uh, and so in verse 2 and 3, he says, For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. For no one understands, but in, in his spirit he speaks mysteries. But one who prophesies speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consolation. And so as he speaks here in verse 2, what he tells us is that true tongue speakers is only understood by God. And in, in, in other words, what that means is, in, in verse 2, he says, for one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. Now, you might say, well, why does he, why does he say that? Uh, well, what he means is that since you and I don't know every language, if a tongue speaker is speaking and nobody understands him, he must be talking to God. 
because God understands every single language in the world. And so the question is, did God give us tongue speaking so we could talk to God? Is that why he gave us tongue speaking? And people who speak in tongues can talk to God better than we can? No. I believe what he's telling us here is that if a tongue speaker is speaking and no one can, un no one can interpret it or understand it, then apparently he's talking to God because God's the only one that can understand him. And he says, but in his spirit, he speaks mysteries. And that suggests to you that he's talking about a true tongue speaker. That's under consideration. And so that's one of the things that he's pointing out is a true tongue speaker is only understood by God. And that's the first word in your little outline that you want to fill in there. God understands him because God understands every language. But verse 3 says, but one who prophesies speaks to men for edification, exhortation, and consolation. And so in verse 3, he says, but a prophet is understood by all. You might say, well, what do you mean by it? How is a prophet understood by all? Well, what he means by that is that when you send a prophet to go preach to somebody, you don't send him preaching a foreign language than the country that he goes to. The reason I would go to Central America in order to preach is because I know Spanish. I'm no good if you send me to the Philippines unless there's a translator there. But if I'm going to go preach somewhere, I'm going to preach in the language of those people. And so therefore, that's why most of my work that I've done outside of here and outside of English is done in Latin American countries like Mexico and Cuba and Central America and Guatemala and those places is because a prophet is sent to people who know the language that he's speaking. So when he says here, a prophet is understood by all, he's not saying that every time a prophet speaks, you understand everything he says. But what he's saying is, is you can understand what it is that he's saying. You understand his language. Now, a tongue speaker can speak, and you might not understand what he's saying because he might be speaking in, in uh, Italian, and you don't know Italian. And so therefore, you don't know what he's saying. And that's the same, that's, these principles are true when it comes to preaching the word of God. You know, one of the reasons we have a little kids class or we worship is because the little kids need the message of God brought down to a level where they can understand it. For them to be kept in the adult class where big words are used and big concepts are used is not very loving for them. And that's one of the reasons why we like to have that we worship that we have. So they can get a message at their own level. And the reason we do that is because we love them and we want to serve them and do that. So remember, that's the, that's the principle that's going on in here as he's speaking about tongues. Now, verse 4 and 5 says, One who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but one who prophesies edifies the church. Now, I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you would prophesy. And greater is one who prophesies than the one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets, so that the church may receive edifying. So, uh, uh, tongues, uh, uh, prophecy edifies everyone who hears. That's what he's getting to in verses 4 and 5. That's the difference between, between tongue speaking and prophesying. The, in verse 4, he says, one who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but one who prophesies edifies the church. And so the gifts uh, are to edify others. You remember in 1 Corinthians 12, as we were studying 1 Corinthians 12, he says the purpose for the gifts is they're given to each per person for the common good. That's why the gifts are given. The gifts weren't given for the individual person for himself and by himself, for him to use for himself. Now, he might get some benefit from it, but the purpose is for him to be able to to share the message with others and bring other people to Jesus. Once he's been brought to Jesus, that's pretty much the work of the Holy Spirit as far as getting him into Jesus. Jesus, or the Holy Spirit might want to round out his character and make him more of a Christian, but the purpose for the message and the purpose for the gifts was to bring him to Jesus. And once he comes to Jesus, uh, he, he then can learn more, but the gifts were given for the purpose of bringing them to Jesus. And so the gifts are for the common good. And that's why verse 4 says, one who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. Well, tongue speaking wasn't for the purpose of edifying yourself. It was for the purpose of edifying the church. And then it says, but one who prophesies edifies the church. In other words, the person who speaks in a language everybody can understand, he is going to edify the church, and the church is going to be encouraged. In verse 5, he says, now I wish that you all spoke in tongues, 
but even more that you would prophesy. And greater is the one who prophesies than one who speaks in a tongue, unless he interprets so that the church may receive about edifying. So, so there it is. Prophecy is better because it helps. And that's the word you want in there. The word you wanted in the, in the previous one was edify. And so prophecy is better because it helps. That's the purpose for the gifts. The gifts were to help other people. It was to help the church. It was to help the church grow stronger, to help the church uh, understand the word of God. It was to help the church understand the nature of Jesus. It was to help the church grow and mature. That's the purpose for the gifts. And that's why he says, now I wish that you all spoke in tongues, because tongues can also be used for that. But notice what he says at the end. Uh, 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 he has to interpret. Now I want you to understand it says he has to interpret. Now, interpret means that you are actually translating a language. Not that you're saying, I think I get a feeling that maybe he's saying this. No. The reason I, I tell you that is because it's uh, it, interpreting means that you're interpreting a language, that you're looking at the, at the language and you're making the equivalent of those words in another language. You're not just coming up with, some feeling that says, well, I think he's saying this. Now, why am I saying that? Well, because today, tongue speaking sometimes in many churches is a problem. They'll, they'll speak in tongues or they'll say they're speaking in tongues, but nobody knows what they're saying and nobody's interpreting. And if somebody interprets, they, they say, I think maybe he's saying this. See, it's not a matter of I think. If you interpret Spanish, you can tell people in English exactly what's being told in Spanish. It's not a matter of I think. It's a matter of this is what he says. And so remember that that's, that's the difference. He said, if you're just speaking in tongue and you don't have an interpreter, it's not really any good. But if you're prophesying, then it's good. Well, why? Could you send prophets in the same language of the people that are going to receive the message? That's what you do. That's the reason, that's the reason God has people who have translated the Bible into almost every language of the known world so that every every tongue can have its own copy of the Bible and be reading the same thing in their own languages so that we can all come to the knowledge of Jesus is Lord. And so that, that's what this is referring to. <clears throat> but why is it or how is it that, that, that it is that tongue speaking can't edify the group? Well, verses 16 through 12 says this, but we're going to look at the, uh, down to verse 9 first. He says, but now, brethren, if I come to you speaking in, a, in tongues, what will I profit you unless I speak to you either by way of revelation or of knowledge or prophecy or teaching? Yet even lifeless things, either flute or harp, in producing a sound, if they do not produce a distinction in the tones, how will it be known what is played on the flute or on the harp? For if the bugle produces an indistinct sound, who will prepare himself for battle? So also you, unless you utter by the tongue speech that is clear, how will it be known what is spoken? Or you will be speaking into the air. So in this section, he's telling us about the manner of edification. How does edification work? Well, look at what he says in verse 6. Verse 6 says, But now, brethren, if I come to you, if I come to you speaking in tongues, what will I profit you? Unless I speak to you either by way of revelation or by knowledge or by prophecy or by teaching. Now, again, revelation, knowledge, and prophecy and teaching are done in the language of the people that you are trying to teach, that you are trying to prophesy to, that you are trying to share knowledge to, that you are trying to reveal a message of God. It wouldn't do you any good to send, a, to send me to Germany to preach the gospel in Germany without a translator, because I might be able to preach to them in English and I can preach to them in Spanish, but it's not going to do them any good because they don't have, I don't have a translator. And so that, that's his point that he's making here. So he says, really, really what people ought to be speaking in church is rather than running around speaking in tongues that nobody understands, he says what they ought to be doing is they ought to be uh, teaching a, a, a message, a revelation from God in, in the language of the people that where they're at, or some knowledge in the language of the people where they're at, or prophecy in the language of the people where they're at, or teaching in the language of the people where they're at. You see, for me to go to Germany and, 
and speak English and then speak Spanish, I might be able to brag to them and say, look at how I can speak two languages, but it doesn't do them any good. And that would not be loving them. That would not be helping them. And that would not be a proper use of the gifts that God has given to us. Whether in New Testament times they were miraculous or whether today we might call them normal gifts that are given to us by God. And that's why in verse uh, 7 and 8, he then says this, Yet even lifeless things, either flute or harp, in producing a sound, if they do not produce a distinction in the tones, how will it be known what is played on the flute or on the harp? For if the bugle produces an indistinct sound, who will prepare himself for battle? He says it's only natural that you understand that, that uh, uh, even bugles and instruments, they have to be played in a certain way. There are certain rules to music that you have to follow in order for it to sound pleasant to people. It, uh, you know, probably most of you don't know, but you know, I've been trying to learn the piano for years. And if you ever come over to my house, I'll never play for you. Because you wouldn't recognize, exactly, Troy, you wouldn't recognize what I'm playing. Because I'm not very good at it. And, and you would wonder, what song is he playing? And so we understand that for something to be understood, people have to be able to understand it. People have to be able to know what it is that you're doing. And I think it's really interesting that God spent a whole chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 speaking about tongues, because I think God was looking down the line and understanding that this was going to be a problem in cultures today. Because you see, if you, if you claim you're a prophet and you make a prediction doesn't come true, people are going to know you're wrong, aren't they? If you tell somebody some information that you say you got from God, but people will read, read in the Bible and it says something different, they're going to know you're wrong, aren't they? But if you speak in tongues, nobody can tell you you're wrong and nobody can tell you you're right because nobody knows what you're saying. And so that's why you have today in many, in many churches a big push to speak in tongues because who's going to be able to tell you whether you're whether you're telling the truth or not who's going to be able to tell you whether you're speaking gibberish or not and the answer is no one you you might look impressive but the purpose for speaking in tongues isn't for you to look impressive it's for the church to be encouraged and edified because unintelligible tongues is air talk that's the next word you want in there the other two words were understanding and understandable. Unintelligible uh, tongues is air talk. That's what verse 9 says. He says, so also you, unless you utter by the tongue speech that is clear, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. You see, if somebody speaks in a tongue, even if it is a true language, but you and I don't understand it, well, they might as well just be talking to the air because we don't understand it. Uh, and, and, and therefore, somebody who knows a multitude of languages, they might be able to speak all those languages, but it doesn't do me any good. And I might be impressed with their ability to speak languages, but if they're doing it to impress me, then they don't understand the gifts of God and the fact that they're given to us so that we can benefit other people. And we do that by loving them and using the gifts that we have in a way that they can understand it that they can use it, and we're not just talking in the air. I know a young couple, and they moved from here, and they, they went and started attending at, a, at, another, uh, at another church. And when, when they attended, they came back and visited, and they said, you know, one of the things we don't like about our preacher is that he uses really, really big words. And he says, we don't understand the really big words. If you've, you've been around me for a long time, I don't use really big words. I, I don't use them. I don't spend a lot of time talking to you about Greek. I don't spend a lot of time talking to you about Hebrew and Hebrew languages because you don't understand it. So what good would it, do, would it do me to do that? You'll just have to trust me. But the problem was, was that that person wasn't loving the congregation. He was just trying to be more impressive by using big words so that he would look educated and he would look wise. And by the way, that was the problem with the church at Corinth. Remember what started this whole discussion? was their attitude of I'm, a, I'm of Apollos and I have Paul and I have Cephas and I'm smart and you're not. 
and we have a better teacher than you do. And, and so they were excited about those gifts that made them look good and look better than other people. And that's why Paul says, well, it's okay to desire tongues, but you got to have an interpreter. But everybody should want to prophesy. And so that's why verse 9 says, so also you, unless you utter by the tongue speech that is clear, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. In verses 10 through 12, it says, there are perhaps a great many kinds of languages in the world, and no kind is without meaning. If then I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be to the one who speaks a barbarian, and the one who speaks will be a barbarian to me. So also you, since you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. And so one of the things that he points out in verse 10 is that languages are meant to be understood. Any language, any tongue in the Bible, and any tongue that a tongue speaker speaks actually has a meaning to it. Now, I'm talking about true tongue speaking, not sometimes gibberish that people claim to be tongue speaking, but I'm talking about tongue speaking. You know, I, I've told you guys that I love watching the, the nature channels. And this last week, I was watching the nature channels about these whales that communicated to one another by clicking under underwater. And so they're clicking to one another. And as they're clicking, I don't know what they're saying, but the whales do. The whales knew that language. Now, that's not, that's not a man language, that's an animal language, but even that language has a meaning that the whales understood and that, this, that the whales were able to, to work together. And by the way, inside each and every one of you is a language code. It's called DNA. And your DNA can be read by scientists and tell you what color hair you have or whether you're a boy or whether you're a girl or uh, what color eyes you're going to have. And it's amazing the, the things that they're able to do now by looking at the DNA. And they're saying that sometime here in the near future, you might be able to pick out the eye color of your child or the skin color or the, or, or the hair texture uh, because we know the code that DNA is. So every language has, an, has a meaning to it. Every language can be understood by somebody if it's a real language. Now, you and I don't understand every language. But every language is meant to be understood by someone somewhere for the purpose of communicating. And that's why God gave the, the New Testament church the gift of tongues so that wherever they went, whatever country they went to, they could speak in the language of the people that they're talking to. And so verse 11 says, If then I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be to the one who speaks a barbarian, and the one who speaks will be a barbarian to me. That, that word barbarian simply means a stranger or a foreigner. If you've ever if you've ever been walking uh, somewhere or may, maybe you know on the park or something and you walk by some people and they're speaking some other language, you know they're foreigners. You, you, you know that's who they are. Well, how do you know that? By their language. They're a barbarian to you. That's all the word means. And what he's saying is, if I'm speaking uh, you know Spanish to somebody who knows English, he's going to think I'm a foreigner. He's going to think that I can't speak uh, English. And so that's what he's pointing out. He says that's what tongue speakers do when they speak in, uh, in an English congregation, but they speak some gibberish or really some other language, but the English congregation doesn't understand them. What good is it? It doesn't do them any good. It's like if that guy's a foreigner. Why in the world would we be letting foreigners preach in church where everybody speaks English unless there is an interpreter? And so verse 12 says, so also you, since you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. He says, do you really, really want to do what God wants you to do? Then, that, then that's good that, you're, that you want these gifts of God. And certainly it's good for us to have gifts of God, right? It's certainly good for us to learn other languages so that we can talk to our friends. It's certainly good for us to go to school and, you know, get a master's degree in science so that we can use what we learn to teach people about how God made the world, all of that's really good if we're going to use it for the purpose of edifying other people. But if I'm just going to use it for hanging a plaque on my wall and going, look, you know, I have five degrees, look at how smart I am, then guess what? It's worthless. And that's what he's pointing out here. 
So also you, since you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. So it's wonderful for us to study the scriptures. It's wonderful for us to know the scriptures and, and to learn Greek and to learn Hebrew and to learn all that stuff. But if the people you're talking to don't know it, then why in the world are you going to tell it to them unless you interpret it for them? Unless you're just trying to make yourself look good. And as God's people, we're all equal and the same and we're all trying to encourage one another and help one another. And so therefore, what edifies is preferred. That's his point that he's making here. Verse 13 through 17. Therefore, let one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if, he, for if I speak, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What is the outcome then? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray, pray with the mind also. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the mind also. Otherwise, if you bless in the spirit only, how will the one who fills the place of the ungifted say the amen at your giving of thanks since he does not know what you are saying? For you are giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not edified. And so here he's talking to us about what happens with tongues without a translator. And what he tells us is, is that it's useless. Tongues need to be interpreted because the purpose for tongues is to edify the church. So if I'm going to edify you and you only talk English, then I'm going to speak English to you. But if uh, somebody from Mexico comes in, I'm going to talk Spanish with them so that they can be encouraged because that's what we're supposed to do. Now, if somebody from Germany comes in and I have a friend who knows German and I want to talk to them, I'm going to go get my friend who knows German and say, come with me and interpret what I'm telling, what I'm saying to this German friend of mine. Because what we want is we want the message known so that those people can come to the knowledge of Jesus. That's why verse 14 says, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. In, in other words, what he's saying is, uh, when you speak in tongues or you pray in tongues, even the person saying the tongue doesn't know what he's saying. That's what makes it a tongue. See, I don't need the gift of tongues if I can speak Spanish. Now, I need the gift of tongues if I want to speak French or German or Italian, because I never studied those things. And so even the person who's speaking tongues doesn't know what he's saying. Now, in his spirit, he knows he's saying something because God has put it, put it into him. And I'm talking about real tongue speakers. God has really put that message inside of him, and he's speaking properly. And so therefore, he, he knows he's saying something, but his mind, what he's saying, he doesn't know. And so that's why in verse 14 it says, Or if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So... Here's the question. Does God just want your spirit encouraged, but your mind to be left out? You see, that's, that's what the world thinks of Christians. The world thinks of Christians that they got all the, their spirit-filled people, they got all the spirit in them, but they left their brains at the door. And so they believe in stupid stuff like a fish swallowed Jonah or like the walls of Jericho fell down flat or God parted the Red Sea, they believe that kind of stupid stuff because they left their brains at home. And they're just spirit people filled with the spirit. You see, God says, no, that's not how edification works. God's edification works by encouraging the spirit and the mind. That's what he's pointing out here. And so verse 15 says, what is the outcome then? What should I do then? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the mind also. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the mind also. So Paul says he doesn't spend a whole lot of time praying in tongues because he, does, he doesn't know what it means, but he will pray and make sure that he understands what he's praying. And that's the same thing that he does with singing. That's the same thing. That's why sometimes you ask a little kid some of the sounds that they hear in a song uh, and, and I can't remember the exact song, but, but uh, uh, one of the lyrics is translated by little kids as, beat me till I want no more. When it actually says, feed me till I want no more. But little kids don't hear it, and they don't understand it. And so therefore, it doesn't make sense to them. Spiritual activity edifies the mind as well as the spirit. So you wanted the word interpreted and mind in that section. Because true edification, that's the next word you want, includes both spirit and mind. That's why verse 15 says what it did. 16 and 17 says, Otherwise, if you bless in the spirit only, 
how will the one who fills the place of the ungifted say the amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not know what you are saying? For you are giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not edified. So here he's using the idea of giving thanks in the spirit. Uh, and he tells us in verse 16 that otherwise, if you bless in the spirit only, in other words, you're, 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 you're speaking according to the, the tongue speaking and the spirit's giving you this message that you don't understand, but you know it's coming from the Holy Spirit. He says, how will the one who fills the place of the ungifted say the amen? By the ungifted means he doesn't know that language. At your giving of thanks, since he does not know what you are saying. See, he doesn't know that language. So you can pray all you want in French. It won't do us any good. None of us will be able to say the amen. Verse 17 says, for you are giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not edified. Spiritual gifts were given for the purpose of edification. Even the normal gifts we have today were given for the purpose of edification. Gifts are to edify the church. That's what the gifts are for. And so Paul, in the last two verses, gives you his example. Let's look at his example. Verse 18 says, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. However, in the church, I desire to speak five words with my mind so that I may instruct others also rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. The first thing I want you to understand about this verse is Paul says, I can speak in tongues. You want, you want to speak in tongues? Paul says, I can speak in tongues. He's an apostle. He goes to every part of the world. He can speak in tongues. Of course he needs to speak in tongues. Paul says, I can speak in tongues. But he says, but it, when it comes to being in the church, in a certain community, he says, however, in the church, I desire to speak five words with my mind so that I may instruct others also, rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. Now, when he says 10,000 words of a tongue, he's assuming there's no interpreter. He says, I'd rather speak just five words in English than speak 10,000 words in Ital Italian to you guys. Why? Because the 10,000 words in Italian aren't going to help you. But the five words are. And those gifts were given to us. Language was given to us for the purpose of helping others. Just like every single gift God has given us is given us for the purpose of helping one another and encouraging one another. Somebody might say, yeah, Mike, but the problem is, is that when the Spirit comes on you, you can't help but talk. You got to talk. Well, look at 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 32. 1 Corinthians 14, 32 says, Gift, uh, gifted saints can choose when to use their gifts. Verse 32, and we'll cover this in the, in the next lesson. Verse 32 says, And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. You see, God says, if I gave you a gift whether it's a miraculous gift during New Testament times, or whether it's a normal gift today through the Spirit, you have control of it, God says. You can use it or not use it. You see, when it comes to me raising my voice, God gave me the ability to raise my voice. I choose when to use it. Sometimes I don't use it when I should, or I use it when I shouldn't. But it's a choice God has given me because God has filled us with the ability to do the things that we have. Because God has given uh, to us the spirit of life, and he's given to us all of those gifts. So whatever gift God has given to you, whatever gift he's given to you, it's not given to you just for you. It's given to you, and especially if you're a Christian, to think of other people, to encourage other people, and especially God's people, and especially in bringing people to Jesus. So in conclusion, remember, Jesus adds kingdom people to his church. Spiritual people are to use their, uh, their spirit-given gifts in love to help others come to know Christ. And those people who are spiritual-minded are baptized into Jesus Christ to be born again 
and serve God by helping others know Christ. So if you need to be baptized in Jesus, you need to pray with you for you, uh, just let us know and we can make arrangements. Uh, but we're now going to sing song number 307 as we encourage one another to faithfulness. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? sound like a car horn <laughs> but I do love you before I pray I would just I want to mention uh, I brought some of you towels and stuff to cover the windows uh, if you if you be patient I'll come by and grab them before you leave so I could have them for next next Sunday uh, I asked for prayer for for my son it's easy to remember his names it's a, it's the same as mine uh, Troy Jr. is having some marital uh, problems, and, and he needs some prayer. Uh, if you would do that for, for, for him, we appreciate it. Uh, shall we pray? Oh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you. I want you to know that we love you with our hearts, Lord, and our minds, and our spirits, Lord. Lord, I ask you to be with us this week. As we, as we go to work, as we go to and fro, Lord, I ask you to be strongly in our minds, in our hearts. Lord, help us make our decisions on what you would want us to do. Lead us in all things, Lord. Don't let us astray. Make us strong in you, Lord. Let us think like you, Lord. Oh, Jesus, thank you so much for coming here, teaching, uh, teaching us your word, teaching us how to live our lives. I thank you, Lord. I thank you so much. Jesus, you're amazing. And I appreciate you so much for being in my life and in my brothers' and sisters' lives. Thank you so much, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Right. Uh, first and uh, this first for this morning. In the bulletin on the very back page of our prayer list, there's a request uh, from me. I've been putting together a pictorial directory that looks a whole lot like that. I don't know if you can see it. I'm going to pass them out today. There's some of them missing information, some missing uh, the pictures, some missing address, some missing phone numbers. A lot of people don't have emails, which I understand that. But I, I will be handing these out in 
just ask that you uh, call me or text me or email me current information for our directory so we can have a complete directory. There's a lot of people on there in our prayer list today. I do hope and pray that you look through the prayer list and realize the, the people who have gone to new care homes. Georgia is now living in the same care home where Jerry Burnett has lived for the past year. And her family was very relieved to find a care home like that with godly people, with a godly purpose, and taking care of other godly people. And uh, so she's, she's going to be out there. We noticed that uh, Bill Turner is, is in a new care home over in the Greenhaven area. Um, he is in hospice. He's, he's not expected to live much more than two months at the most. So remember him in your prayers. Remember Lily in your prayers. And uh, George is at home, and he's doing well. Very happy to see Faye here this morning, comfortable enough to, to come to services this morning. Uh, happy also to see Lily here this morning. I'm hoping she got a good night's rest last night since she did not sleep for the two nights that Bill was at home. But um, there are just a, an awful lot of people that we need to pray for. We need to pray for our country. We need to pray for all those who are affected by the COVID virus, those who are unemployed, those who have lost businesses because of this, this virus. I can't, there's one announcement that a lot of you won't recognize the name. Mike let me know this week that a former member here named Jim Hennessy his wife Song, who had left here and moved up to Oregon, Jim passed away this last week. And uh, I have Song's address and phone number if you would like to send her a card. Uh, another very spiritually minded couple that, that uh, we were blessed to get to know for a short while. I have no further announcements. Please don't rush out because I need to grab my basket so uh, I can, I'm going to hand out the directories today. So please take your time as you're driving out because you might rear in someone else because of me. So thank you. God bless you. And we'll see you next week. Don't forget about waiting if you have a towel so that Troy can pick them up. Thank you for being here and pray God's blessed you for, for listening and hearing. And hope all of you that are listening at home have been blessed.